So today, like I mentioned, I think we can basically start. We're going to be looking at cross-selling part three. Um, we know what is the early morning show. So we have our, our weekly broadcast. Um, and by the way, guys, if you don't know, on next week, as usual, we have the early morning show on Thursday. We're going to do cross-selling part four, the final part for cross-selling this month. But on the Wednesday, also at 8.30 until 9.30 in the morning, Central European time, we have another ad hoc um, broadcast on legal writing. And this is a mixture of legal writing and sales writing. So it's called the persuasive email. Um, it's going to be YouTube because we generally, uh, I, I find that Zoom is a bit of a nuisance. Sometimes there's problems with it. So I've just put it onto YouTube. And you just go on YouTube and you can watch it live. And if you miss it, it's going to be recorded. Um, you can find it on the Nicodonia channel in YouTube. Uh, so you can you can see it there. And of course, it's a good idea to subscribe because then you'll get reminders about the different broadcasts coming. So next week, there are two different live streams. We have the early morning show on Thursday about cross-selling. And we have the sales writing persuasive email on Wednesday. Um, as normal, today we have our 16 key concepts, which we're going to be looking at. And if you want a copy of the slides afterwards, then there's some advertising included in the slides as well. Um, I'm actually thinking this might be the wrong version of the presentation. So bear with me a second, because I think I know last night I made a better, an updated version. So let's see if I can change that. Yeah, thank you. So I had some extra ideas. Yeah, that's the one. So this, this is the key concepts we're going to be looking at today. Even if you have studied cross-selling with me in person before the pandemic or, or even this year, this, th these are new concepts. This is uh, further development. We're going to look at um, some different instruments that we, can, that we can use. Some of them you won't have heard about because I made them, <laughs> uh, such as uh, connecting ABC analysis to link analysis. We're going to look at the thing called the 124 motivational system. That's if I was a boss, this is how I would make a motivational system to do a financial incentive for cross selling. Uh, but like I've mentioned before, I haven't found any financial motivational systems from several hundred law firms that actually work uh, to motivate lawyers to do business development. <clears throat> um, I'm going to look at a couple of more common mistakes and how we can we can overcome these mistakes. Um, going to look at uh, a thing called life cycle cross-selling, which I mentioned last time. Going to look at a combination of cross-selling and upselling, which I call the cross-upsell, which you won't have come across either because I made it. Going to look at some of the activities that you could do in the cross-sell meetings and a few final ideas. So some of this is developing on the concepts which we saw in the previous two sessions. And again, if you have any questions or comments, just put them into the Q&A function um, and I'll answer them because I think that's more, more interesting than if I just do my monologue. So um, the first concept for today is regarding to whom you should start your cross-selling with. So of course, as we remember, cross-selling is when you introduce another colleague, um, another practice to an existing client. It's possible to make a very classical mistake here. And the mistake that I notice being made in the big four and in the international law firms is that we assume just because we have a good relationship with a client in one practice area, that they're going to be willing to speak to our friend in another practice area or even in another country. That's not necessarily the case. So the first mistake is social equity is probably not enough. You need to have the good relationship and high quality legal work to begin with, uh, but then it's a very much better idea to have some kind of value proposition. So this comes back down to solution-based pitching or product-based pitching. If you're going to introduce one, if you're working with a client in, in corporate law, you want to introduce them to your friend in tax law, then it's a good idea for your colleague in tax law to have some kind of value proposition or product to actually be offering them. We need to assume 
the other lawyer objection. You need to assume just because you're working with them in tax uh, in corporate law doesn't mean they're not already working with someone else in another law firm in tax law. Therefore, what can you offer? So you need to have some kind of product or solution from your colleague to be able to answer that. Then in terms of choosing which of your clients you should start cross-selling to, uh, well, we know that cross-selling works easiest with your current clients. Uh, the second position would be with your ex-clients to recontact them and re-engage them. And the third position, of course, is to try and pitch um, to, to the new clients. So we're going to focus on current clients. Now, in terms of the current clients, we can divide our current clients into three categories, A, B, or C. If you do an analysis of revenues per client, and it doesn't matter if you do this on a company basis or if you do this on a practice basis, for example, competition law, um, corporate law, M&A, real estate, you're probably going to find a similar kind of distribution of revenue. A clients are your top 20% of clients uh, in terms of revenue, and they generate maybe 80% of your revenues. So it's the Pareto principle. We have some B clients who are in the middle. They, they're no, they're okay. They are some commodity work, some premium work. There's quite a few of them. And then we have the long, long, long tail of C clients. These are the ones which don't generate too much work for us. They're more commodity, but they're good for training up the lawyers. So the, the youngsters get some more experience. So when you're looking at your clients, A, B, and C, it is your A clients that are the ones that are going to be of most potential for cross-selling. Um, but it's also going to be the A clients which have the strongest ownership or possession to specific partners. You will find that if you have those top 20% of clients, there's some partner who's going to be owning them and possessing them. And that might sometimes be a barrier to cross-selling. So we have to be kind of realistic here. You're probably going to have more success with the cross-selling with the B clients, just in terms of political interest, that there will be some less senior people or they're not of, of such um, established relationships. So once you've done your ABC analysis, we're going to look at our A and our B clients. Our A clients, we can expect that there might be some possession mentality, so there can be political barriers to cross-selling and some, some kind of trust issues. B clients, these are the ones which probably have the most potential in cross-selling because we can identify clients which do not have such a strong ownership and possession, and their client relationship manager might even not be at partner level, which means that these are the clients which will probably, although the A revenue from cross-selling isn't going to be as high as the A clients could be, it's possible to work with them and to get cross-selling practically more easily. And some of these B clients are going to then grow into A clients, which belong to the firm, which are not possessed by a specific partner. So then once you've done that, you do a links analysis. A links analysis means for each of these A and B clients, we examine the current links that we have as a law firm to them. What relations do we have? And you're going to discover quite likely the one, 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 one mistake, the four ones that you have, especially with A clients, one partner in one practice in one country, uh, with one client. So you're going to have a very tenuous link with a lot of your A and B clients. And this is extremely dangerous. It's not just extremely dangerous in case your partner leaves and joins another law firm or makes their own practice. It's also dangerous just in case the relationship stops. If there, maybe there's some kind of dispute or some falling out, maybe the work in that area just finishes, and then you're going to lose that A or B client. So once you've done your ABC analysis and you've done your links analysis, you then examine and, and you would have to do this in hand in hand with the client relationship owner, the partner or the senior lawyer, who could we potentially cross sell and introduce as a T for three for these A or B clients. In reality, I have a suspicion that some of the A clients will not for different reasons, will not end up getting introduced to different partners, and this tenuous relationship will continue. So maybe I'm being a little bit cynical here, but I would suspect that you can introduce 
some uh, cross cell where there isn't a perception that this might endanger the primary relationship. So again, that big synergy between tax and legal, I think a lawyer might feel more comfortable if they possess and they have the direct relationship to a client for legal work and not see the tax area as being too much a threat to their relations, especially if they're allowed to re remain the key account holder. So for the A clients, this can be more difficult, but for the B clients, you can really integrate them further. You can get two, three, four um, cross-sell meetings, integrate them across different practices, and that will really consolidate your position with them and help these B clients then escalate and grow up to, to A clients. Um, it's... I don't think this is too complicated. I've written a paper, of course, <laughs> about this. So if you have any questions, this is a type of, type of analysis and an activity that you could do. Ideally, this would take place over two to three months. So it's not, it's not too long to do. Result would be higher client retention, changing more of your satisfied clients into raving fans, uh, greater revenues for the practice, greater client value. So it's altogether a good thing. And I suspect that in the long term, it's going to be those integrated B clients that become A clients. They're going to be really the cash cows, although this might take one or two years until they replace the current top A clients. In a related light, I noticed from a few law firms, and they really are the minority, that you... And I, we have one or two of these colleagues because I can see them on the list here. Uh, we have some law firms where you do have a business development colleague or however you want to call it, a non-partner client relationship manager. So my recommendation would be this is a very good idea. You should have someone who has a certain degree of seniority. So maybe they're going to be a little bit older. So to be taken seriously by the partners. Um, perhaps somebody who's also ideally with some good experience in the legal industry or an ex-lawyer themselves, so probably over 30, maybe over 40. And for these strategic future clients who are going to integrate in cross-selling, especially the B clients that we identified in ABC analysis and links analysis, the client relationship manager probably shouldn't be the partner. It should be either a purely business development person um, or it could be maybe a senior lawyer who is not yet at partner level. The idea here is that in future, we want to overcome this possession mentality, that if you let a lawyer possess the client and the lawyer grows with that client, of course, the lawyer is going to retain that client. And then, you know, you're, you're in the, that, the same situation like you have now with a lot of your A clients. It's not going to be easy to, to break that and integrate the client, really. Um, so while a lot of law firms have marketing people, so you have someone uh, who does very good work with your legal 500 and your chambers and your social media and brochures and webinars and all of that kind of stuff, less law firms have more business development or sales people or people doing both. And I would really recommend then moving to a certain position of seniority where you have that kind of non-partner client relationship manager. And their objective is the integration of that client into the firm across the different practice areas. They will not be biased towards possessing that client for one specific practice. Um, I can think of a few examples of such colleagues. They're quite rare. Um, there is one... I shouldn't mention the name of the company because I didn't ask for permission. So I don't know if this is anything that they wouldn't want me to say, but there's one very large Central American law firm uh, present in quite a few jurisdictions in Guatemala, Honduras, Belize, Panama, and so on. And they're very cutting edge. And they, they I won't embarrass her by mentioning her name, but she's actually on the call. And um, this, this is a very, very good kind of idea to have to strategically over time, and it can take months, years to overcome this uh, possession mentality to prevent the, the cross-selling from happening. You need a non-partner client relationship manager. I think that's part of the solution. Again, if you want the lawyers to do business development at all, <laughs> and, um, and this is maybe less of an issue, okay, for partners, it's a different kind of issue. We remember the one, two, four mistake. If you say, if you're a managing partner and you say, hey, lawyers, you go out there, you bring in new clients, we'll give you 10% of that revenue. 
a lot of the lawyers won't be able to do it because they don't know how to find new clients. It's the most difficult thing that they can do. And they won't develop current clients or ex-clients because it's not considered business development. It's not recognized or rewarded. So that's the one, two, four mistake. That's the origination bonus mistake that I was talking about last time. A few times I was asked by managing partners, what would be the ideal motivational system financially to get lawyers to do business development? And I was very honest in saying, I don't think that that's the best approach anyway. You need to combine a financial motivational system to give recognition and praise and reward for doing cross-selling and current client development. But the real motivation is going to be a sense of ownership for a niche, a practice niche or an industry niche that that lawyer is developing for themselves in order to raise their profile and their eminence. And if they have a passion and enthusiasm for that area, then they can be more convinced to do that, to become a better lawyer, to become a better subject matter expert, uh, to meet the different movers and shakers in the industry. So I would do both. I would have niche practice or industry ownership for a lawyer, starting at junior associate level even. And I would use a one to four motivational system. So this quite simply means that for each of the three categories, for one, for the current clients, for two, for the ex-clients, and for four, for the new clients, you give a percentage of revenue generated. It might be good to have, let's say, 10% for current clients. Maybe it would be 8% for ex-clients. Maybe it would be 6% for new clients. In this case, we will be emphasizing and rewarding a market consolidation approach. So maybe for the first quarter, the first half year, maybe even the first year, that's the kind of bias that we would have. We're going to reward current client development. So this is upselling, this is cross-selling, this is reselling. And in second place, it's going to be reconversion of X and dormant clients. And in last place, it's going to be new client development. So begin with the easy stuff. You might have 10% for current clients, 5% for X, and zero for new. Perhaps we don't want and we don't need to do new client hunting it yet. Actually, I predict you probably don't. You probably have so much capacity to develop your current and ex clients that you're overlooking. Chasing after new clients might not be the wisest investment of resources. Um, the good approach here is that you can change it. After the first period, you can put the emphasis and the return, the reward onto your ex clients. And then in the, that would be emphasizing a market expansion strategy. So met, let's say the second year. And then the third year, once people have warmed themselves up, got more engaged, then you could have the 10% on the new clients, perhaps 6% on the ex clients and 4% on current clients. So you can shift the strategy depending on the reward on these three different categories of, of clients. Now, one big problem that you're going to have if you try to apply the one to four motivational system is that you might be afraid of the origination dilemma. If I'm a managing partner, I don't want to give a bonus to a lawyer for work that would have come from the client anyway, uh, because there was nothing done to generate that work, just the high quality legal services, which we should be doing. So this is called the origination problem. To overcome the origination problem, we simply make it very clear that the bonuses will only be paid if origination can be evidenced. So if the lawyer can evidence that they sent an AIDA pitch, they sent a proposal about an upsell to a client, and then the client agreed to that, then the lawyer is entitled to the um to the bonus if the lawyer cannot emphasize that they cannot evidence it then we assume that that work would have come anyway and there's no bonus being paid so again you're going to need to have one person who's going to be the kind of final judge uh, on the authority regarding what bonuses are going to be paid based on what evidence it shouldn't be that difficult if a lawyer decided that they don't want to do email pitching regarding their cross-selling, upselling, and reselling, they want to do a T for two or a T for three in person, that's totally fine. That's very admirable, and that's going to have more chance of success. But then for the lawyer themselves to understand, to get the bonus if this works, they should do a follow-up email uh, restating what they had pitched and proposed at that lunch.
So that's got to, to evidence it. Um, I have seen a few law firms which began to implement this kind of one to four motivational system. And of course, I've written a 10 or 12 page. I was paid some different consulting fees a few times uh, by different managing partners to kind of work this out. Uh, basically, that's the idea. You can write it on a postcard. But of course, there's some other uh, pitfalls and issues and so on. So that's why it goes into a 10 or 12 page paper. Um, but taking a step back, what can we see from the one to four motivational system? While I do believe that financial motivation isn't the best way to get lawyers to do cross-selling, uh, it can play a part. And if you combine it with niche specialization, it can be a very nice synergy to get people motivated and enthused. Let's agree, however, that if your law firm doesn't reward cross-selling at all, even worse, if it doesn't recognize or praise cross-selling, then not a lot of people are going to be doing it, um, especially taking into account there is that kind of sensitive possession and ownership uh, issue that we can have at partner level with some, some clients for various reasons. Um, so if you're interested in the one to four motivational system and this kind of uh, bonus system, then you can drop me an email and we can discuss that further. And again, there is <laughs> there's this crazy mistake that I, I, I keep coming across. And that's very often that lawyers don't really know what their colleagues are doing. So what do they do? So you have a friend in competition and antitrust. What exactly do they do? Can you explain it beyond the plain vanilla? Can you explain the compelling value propositions that they have? You need to be able to answer that kind of question. What do they do? What exactly do they do? What can they offer? And if you're going to say something silly and plain vanilla and generic, then that's not going to work for cross-selling. So um, again, like I mentioned before, perhaps a good approach to do would be T for two and then T for three. So T for two, you do an internal T for two. You meet the guy or the lady from um, competition and antitrust. You ask them, what do you do? What's the cool things? What's your value propositions? You get them to explain it to you in plain English. Uh, you get them to tell you the war stories. I, I especially like war stories. So when they tell you a story about a client and they got into a good situation because we helped them or they got into a bad situation because we didn't, um, that I think it's easier for us ourselves as lawyers to understand what our friends and colleagues are doing through war stories and then to repeat that as a soft sell when you have a client meeting. So you need to be able to answer what, what do they do? And unless you yourself are very much an exception, I doubt that you're at that kind of level so far. Uh, most lawyers and partners are not very good at communicating what they do themselves to clients. Uh, forgive me for being very blunt about it, let alone about their colleagues. So again, you need to, you need to clarify and understand that. And of course, uh, the most common excuse against doing not just cross-selling, but business development in general, I'm too busy. I'm too busy. I'm too busy. You're not too busy. If someone is saying that they're too busy to do business development, they're too busy to do cross-selling, it means basically it's not a priority. The priority is the billable hours. The priority is the client phoning you incessantly, demanding questions, asking for things to be done, for the, for the deadline to be, to be matched. Um, it can be very distracting to see the difference between urgency and importance. There's going to be a lot of urgent client work that you have to be doing, urgent, urgent, urgent. It isn't actually um, that important on the strategic bigger picture. Your business development is much more important than the billable hours. Yes, you need to do the billable hours. You need to meet the deadlines, but you do need to have this balance. The billable hours, it's your bread for today. Your business development is your bread for the, for the future. And when you're getting towards partner level or at partner level, you should definitely be delegating away all of this commodity stuff. You, you should be making more time for yourself. And in fact, of course, this is another topic of training that I do. Generally, partners, again, to be polite about it, partners usually have a lot of room for improvement when it comes to delegation skills. 
Um, I could do delegation training, I think, in any law firm, and that would be useful and a good idea. So don't begin to be, say to yourself that you're too busy uh, to do the to do the cross selling and business development. The cross selling with your existing clients would actually be in your own interest, especially if you're coming from a transactional practice. If you do litigation, mergers and acquisition, bankruptcy, white collar crime, it's very risky and foolish to have a pipeline of clients coming to your firm, regardless of your brand. So I don't care if you're DLA Piper or Deloitte or the leading national law firm, um, because sooner or later that pipeline will be disrupted. It's a question of when, not if. There will be a downturn, there will be a crisis, there will be a war or a recession, something's going to happen. So if you integrate your clients so that they're cross-selled and they're held close to the firm, the next time those transactional pieces of work appear, you will be getting them. So again, it's this difference between the short-term approach and, and the long-term. So cross-selling is actually good for everybody in the long-term. Because if you don't do this, you're going to be like a drifting leaf. So this again is me being kind of poetic. Uh, it really never fails to surprise me how many lawyers and even senior lawyers, and I have the suspicion at partner level, are willing to just go with the flow. The work is coming in, they're doing the billable hours, they have the work, they have the salary, and they just drift, drift, drift. And this can continue on for years. Um, and there's no control, and there's no kind of destination. I mean, if you're happy with that, that's fine. But it's, I think it's very, it's very risky. And you don't know exactly where you're going to be going. And you don't know if the work that you're going to be ending up doing is going to be fun and interesting. And in fact, if you find yourself in the position where you're doing more and more commodity work, that commodity work can become less and less valuable. Um, I was reading about, I was actually not just reading about it. Yesterday, I was talking about this in Kosovo, about chat, GPT, and AI. And some of the lawyers and some of the law firms are already getting the idea. Could we begin to try creating contract clauses or different parts of documentation and memoranda using the artificial intelligence? And of course, even now, in 2023, it doesn't totally work. There are problems and mistakes and it's there's lot, quite a few lines to be ironed out but I can see the tendency I can see the trend that this will be disrupted e disruptive even in the legal industry so if you're going to be a drifting leaf and you're quite happy doing the stuff that you're doing you know in a few years quite a lot of that stuff might not be around or it'll be of such low value that you're going to get a significant pay cut you don't want to wait for that to happen. You need to be focusing on going more and more premium. You need to be going towards proactive pitching and to reach client delight, not customer satisfaction. Client delight can probably only be reached through cross-selling by your law firm becoming irreplaceable to the client. If you are only one tenuous link between you and the client, doesn't matter how wonderful you are as a real estate lawyer or corporate lawyer or a tax lawyer. If that law firm, that client is working with different law firms, you are replaceable. And sooner or later, even if you're a big, clever lawyer, they can and they will find someone cheaper, <laughs> probably cheaper, um, and relationships change. So, you know, don't, um, don't be a drifting leaf. That's not going to be a lot of fun and it's kind of risky. And sometimes I, I even I heard this, you know, sometimes I hear this from managing partners. Some of the lawyers, they're just not going to be good in business development. They could be very damaging. They don't have the skills. We don't want to send them to networking events. We don't want them to touch the clients, lock them in the basement, <laughs> and close the key. And they can just be the producers and we'll have one or two uh, partners or, or senior people who actually manage the relations. And this is such a, such a terrible approach to take. It's really awful. That's awful on the, on the side of the people who are kind of creating that system, perhaps with a little bit of humor, hopefully. And it's awful for the lawyers who are willing to put themselves into that position just to be exploited as a legal resource. Um, that's, and it's, it's, it's not a good idea. Everybody can do business development. Everybody should do business development. And the value add from cross-selling will only complement the activities that you're doing. 
So again, this idea between having a few producers, a few lawyers and partners who can do the cross-selling and business development stuff, and then allowing some of the other lawyers just to be academic and to do the legal work, no, that's not a good idea. Absolutely catastrophic idea. I would really not recommend that. Um, oops, I changed the, the concept. And again, guys, like I mentioned, throw some questions or comments. Uh, some of the things I'm saying here may be a little bit controversial. So if you disagree, that's that's cool. We can talk about it. And in terms of your, your cross-selling, not only do you need to present yourself very well, you need to make sure that your colleagues are presenting themselves very well. And again, you need to, a very, very important part of this is making sure that your LinkedIn is optimized and not just your LinkedIn. First of all, you need to make sure that your LinkedIn is optimized, that it doesn't look a mess or not updated. Uh, this is extremely important. Your LinkedIn profile is more important than any resume that you'll ever have. So you need to have your branded wallpaper. You need to have your personal mission statement. You need to have very compelling detailed job description showing the competitive advantages of what you do. But then on the company level, and I'm, I'm looking at our colleagues from, from ILAW and from Cobalt and Sorainen and from AC Tischendorf um, and, and, and so on, you know, I don't think all of you are at that level that you have a, a LinkedIn uniformity of how the, all of the lawyers are presenting themselves. If everyone has different photos, some of them have the same photo from Facebook, some of them have no photos, you have different wallpapers, some of them have no, no mission statement, it doesn't make a good impression. So again, this would be a task to help with the cross-selling because believe me, if you're going to be pitching a T for three, uh, the colleague, the client will look at the profile. And if your profile and your colleague's profile look like two very different presentations, that's not going to make such a good impression. So you need to aim towards LinkedIn uniformity. Again, for our marketing people, our sales and marketing, our business development people, this is going to be another task. It's extremely, extremely important how your law firm presents itself. Even if you were just 10 lawyers and five partners, um, each of the colleagues should have their niche, their niches. Each of them should have their personal mission statement. It should be clear what is the compelling value add from that lawyer, from that lawyer, from that lawyer. And we have defined our footprints so that they complement one another. Even for small to medium sized law firms, there's almost nobody at that level let alone law firms where you have maybe one, two, three hundred or more or more lawyers. This is something which you need to do. And this would then make it easier when you're looking at the cross-selling to be able to answer what do they do? What is their selling point? You don't need to guess it. You don't need to invite, you know, 10 of your internal colleagues for tea for two. That's going to be a lot of tea. Um, right. You could do this on a kind of integrated basis. So aim towards LinkedIn uniformity. And I think... If I could choose one most important part, it would be the personal mission statement. Uh, if you're curious, you can take a look on my page, although I'm my, my one is more about business development. You can see my personal mission statement, who I am, what I do. Um, but you can take a look. You'll find that there are some colleagues who have very good personal mission statements. I can send you some links of some of my friends and colleagues because uh, I helped them with this. And again, with your, with your cross-selling, and with your social media sales, not social media marketing, we're gonna be using LinkedIn for social media sales to help you with your cross-selling. It's very important to measure your clout. So what is clout? Clout means the power and the value of your relationships. So basically speaking, if you have a thousand connections in LinkedIn and they're just random people, you know, half of them are your friends from the law firm that you work in and the law firms you worked in before and your university friends. And then another half of them are maybe some clients, maybe some different people you met at networking events. Then you have very low clout. That's not good. You want to be very Machiavellian and very pragmatic with your social media. If you have that foundation of a thousand random people, that's OK as a foundation. But moving forward, you need to be aiming towards getting high clout. 
If you didn't have a LinkedIn and you were going to start one today and to apply that in your cross-selling, it would be smarter to have maybe 100 connections with key decision makers in your target industry, the CEOs, the founders, the general directors. Um, you need to get more of an industry flavor. Probably that's better than a practice flavor. But even if it's a practice flavor, that would be good on your on, on your clout profile on your LinkedIn. So one activity you could do would be if you have those thousand random connections, that's okay. You're not going to unfriend anyone, but you would then focus on, let's say you're in banking and finance. So you'd make a list of the top 10, 20 banks in your country. You would research. Again, you can use your sales navigator license on LinkedIn for this, which I should I would recommend. I've mentioned it before. It's 80 euros per month for one person. You can find who are the CEOs, the founders, the, the HR, the legal counsel of these. You should be systematically adding on a daily basis five to 10 connections. The annoying thing with LinkedIn is it doesn't tell you how many you're allowed to connect with. And if you go a little bit crazy and you connect with too many people, it blocks you for like a week and then you can't connect. So you need to be systematic with this. Bigger is better, but you can't just add 100 key decision makers in a day because you're going to get blocked. So you start with five to 10 in a day in your target industry. And then after a week or so, if you get away with it, you increase it up to 12. And the bigger your number of connections, the bigger your daily allowance of further connections is. I don't know the algorithm. I think nobody really knows the algorithm. But like for myself, I'm over 18,000 uh, connections with very high clout, at least for my, my, my industry that I'm working, legal industry. And I can add a lot more connections on a daily basis than somebody, than myself, when I had only, you know, 10 times less, 2,000 connections. So <clears throat> you need to look at your LinkedIn in terms of the clout. You begin with your current clients and your ex-clients, the key decision makers there, but you mustn't forget the, the four, the new clients, the target industry, because what would be a wonderful situation to get to would be once you have optimized your LinkedIn profile, you've identified your hit list. Uh, let's say you've, you've got... 100, 200, 300 key decision makers in an industry, then when you begin to pitch infographics and clickable content, snackable content on LinkedIn, it's these guys who are going to see it and they're going to like it and they're going to engage with it. And if someone leaves a comment, you definitely don't simply say thank you to them, which you should do. You don't just reply to that comment. You then very shamelessly send them a private message, in message, because your objective from doing all of this stuff it's not about likes and comments and impressions. It's about getting them out of LinkedIn into the face-to-face -face meetings. Again, it's going to be easier for you to do this with cross-selling than probably just pitching yourself. Even if you have some very nice, compelling value propositions, and understandably, your priority is to develop your own practice, some of your colleagues will have killer UVPs, which are going to be much easier for you to then, to then pitch. So you might do this in a very clever way, that you pitch introduction of your colleague to the, even a new client, and then you come along and you can leverage their good UVP to get a meeting for yourself. So in this case, you're doing a proactive pitch and a cross-sell at the same time. We talked about this the last time, and I'm just aware that I'm talking too much. It's already quarter past. So I'll just continue talking. If you don't, if you don't ask questions or have comments, I'll, I'll just continue with the, um, with the lecture. But again, it's better if you do have some, some questions. We talked about this last time. Another way that you can think about cross-selling is to do life cycle cross-selling. To create four stages of the life cycle of a client, birth and foundation, growth, maturity and stabilization, and death or exit. So we have those four stages. In each of them, for your practice, looking at this from the perspective of corporate or tax or competition, you can do a SWOT analysis. Strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats. What are the different strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats at these four different stages? Further, because this is going to help you to think about the value propositions that you can offer. This can get very complicated. And this is another paper that I wrote. Further, you can then, as this is especially good if you're coming from a small law firm, you can then think of maybe one or two or five of your colleagues. 
what would be the cross-sell products solutions which would work for each of these four stages of the life cycle cross-sell and you identify them now very few law firms um actually i don't think any of the law firms that i'm currently working with uh i i did come across one in singapore but like none of the europeans actually have this this would make your cross-selling a lot more systematic and a lot easier to work out what we can offer and who can cross sell whom depending on the life cycle of the of the client it's quite a fun activity as well this can be done during half a day or a day as a group activity and it's of course one of the day activities that i do so that's life cycle cross selling you could do it yourself though you don't need me um and of course i think we have to understand that to make these kind of changes to get cross selling actually happening like with anything in business development an incremental approach is better. As long as we're making tomorrow better than today, and as long as you have a cross-selling champion, then this can actually happen. And I'm, I'm saying here a cross-selling champion, it doesn't need to be a person who's in charge of business development as a whole, but you should have one, probably for smaller firms, it would be a partner or a senior lawyer. It would be better if it's a senior lawyer rather than a partner even, uh, a non-partner client relationship manager. And for the bigger firms, it would be the business development or sales and marketing person incrementally to make these different steps. Uh, from today's session, the 16 key concepts. This month in cross-selling the 64 key concepts, there is at least 12 different instruments and activities that I've presented in these four lectures. So there's, there's enough stuff to keep you going here, at least for a couple of years in implementing a cross-sell system. Keep in mind, most law firms don't even do cross-sell meetings. So step-by-step step incrementally to, to keep this on track. Um, an interesting idea could be, you're gonna have more chance of succeeding in a T for three in a cross sell, not simply by saying, let me introduce my friend, Susan, she can help you get VAT refunds. That's her specialization, that's her UVP, that's just a cross sell. You're gonna have more success if you can do a cross up sell and what this means is, Susan, I say, this is my friend Susan, she can do this small thing, this commodity thing, and this really big, good, cool, upsell, premium thing. So what's the rationale behind here? We've seen this before. We've seen that if you do an upsell in a, an upsell clause, it desensitizes the client to the price of the more standard product. It's a, it works as a benchmark. It shows that you also have more premium solutions. And sometimes it works that they go for the premium solution. Now, if you just try and cross sell Susan and say she gets you VAT refunds, that's cool. Maybe they agree to have a T for three with you. But if you say she helps you get VAT refunds and based on this analysis for the VAT refunds, she can then show you how to optimize your VAT structuring so that you get some other benefits and other system as well. So you show a small thing that she can do and a big thing that she can do, especially if the small thing can lead into the big thing. Let me give you some examples. So when I was, um, oh, I can't mention the company. When, when, I, was, when I was with one, uh, when I, I'm still actually, when I'm helping one uh, big international firm, we're doing quite a bit of stuff in ESG and environmental. This is trending, even here in in. I'm in North Macedonia today, even here in Macedonia, yesterday in Kosovo, in these very small jurisdictions, it's on the horizon and it's coming and they're not even European Union yet. So in terms of the cross upsell, we could say, hey, we can help you to get sustainable EU grants and funding. So we can analyze the available and suitable grant support and SEC to help you prepare grant applications so you can get through all of the bureaucracy. And there's a lot of it, especially. <laughs> and we'll be to help you to do your tender procedures and so on. Because once you've done that, then my friend Susan can help on the basis of the grants and funding that you can get. She can show you how to deal with energy efficiency. So we can show your cost structures, look at this from a tax and legal perspective to create and oversee different action plans for more dis efficient distribution and consumption. Okay, this might be more difficult for smaller law firms and some of the smaller law firms are not comfortable slipping into the area of legal of um, business consultancy. But these three um, cross up cells, they give you an example of what I'm talking about. We can help you do environmental regulations. It's not very sexy, 
But once we've done that, she can then help you to do ESG data management so that you can get an ESG rating, which means you can then get better investment and funding and make more money from, from potential investors. So if you're just saying the typical legal argument, comply or be fined, people will probably ignore you. Deal with regulations, compliance and regulatory. That's dull. But that can lead to this, then it could be interesting. Sustainability reporting, we can do that to then help you enter into a decarbonization strategy. And this can be very profitable, let's say, in the uh, smelting industry, in the heavy industry industry, uh, heavy industry um, sector and energy. So um, I've, if you're interested in ESG and value propositions, I've got, I've got about 15 of them, and I've examined them from the perspective of commodity and premium and in light of the cross-up sell clause. Um, okay, we have someone anonymous. They have a question here. Regarding the uniformity of LinkedIn profiles, isn't it an option to have a tailored profile showing your capabilities and personal style rather than a profile that doesn't stand out as compared to the other colleagues? Mm, I wouldn't agree on that. From a client perspective, isn't a client more attracted to seeing the different approaches of the members of a team, even in terms of LinkedIn profiles, rather than seeing a very similar appearance of, to all the profiles in a firm, which could look like a lack of personality? Um, my opinion here is, if you are a sole proprietor, if you're an individual like me, you can be as individualistic as you like. You can put as much personal style and flavor. But if you are representing a law firm, I think there should be a uniformity and there should there should be um, an, an interlocking of the value propositions that each of the different people, they have their area of expertise. You should have one kind of style one similar kind of wallpaper, one high quality photo, a similar kind of job descriptions, because you're representing that legal practice. I think that would be my, my take on this. So I would argue more in the direction of uniformity. On the other hand, could I be wrong? Yes, of course I can be wrong. Maybe if you're a small to medium sized law firm, Perhaps I'm, I'm thinking of a, one media law firm I was working with in Moscow and they were very creative and they were doing all sorts of different exciting things. And they, they had very different individual styles and approaches. Maybe if you're coming from a boutique law firm, which is in a specific niche area, like that, an example of media law, then perhaps I would permit or accept more latitude in creativity and individual personalization. But I think for the majority of the firms that I'm working with, especially small to, um, no, especially medium size <clears throat> to large firms, no, I would be biased towards this, this homogeneity of presentation. So yes, you need to be doing cross-sell meetings. You should be, of course, definitely, it goes without saying, you have to be doing business development meeting at least once a month, if not once a week. And from time to time, you do the cross-sell meeting and you do the activities in it. It's not just blah, blah, blah. So many meetings. Um, I won't mention the big international consultancy that I'm thinking of or I had been working for a while. So many meetings are a total waste of time. So many meetings are could be replaced by an email. So many meetings, they just kill time. It shouldn't be blah, 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 and people just talking. You need to be doing some tangible activities together. You have enough knowledge now from this lecture, from the previous two lectures, and from the one next week. You could do your cross-sell meeting once every, I would say once every two months, once every quarter. An hour is more than enough. You do the cross-sell grid. You do coin analysis. You do life cycle analysis. You define the value propositions. You identify the T for threes. Um, you do the ABC and links analysis. There's at least a dozen different activities that you could do, <clears throat> but it isn't just about talking. The metric of success, meeting on meeting, will be the proactive meetings gained. Again, the 4M approach. How many attempts do we have, the messages sent out, the meetings we get, the mandates that come from them, and the money. So from the cross-sale meeting, it would be the metric of success would be how many T's for three, or T's for four that originate out of that after that meeting. We remember that a T for four is a cross referral. So this is when you do a cross sell meeting, a cross sell with a client and an active referral at the same time. So it's you and your client, it's your friend that you're cross selling and you tell the client to bring one of their friends, maybe somebody else in that company um, to create a new 
link to the to the client. If you do ABC analysis and then links analysis, and you find that there's not enough links, you could strengthen it not just by doing T for three cross selling, but especially T for four as cross referral. You're a mergers and acquisitions partner working with the CFO in the company. You do a links analysis and you realize your, your one is the only relationship to that company. So you tell them to bring their HR director and you bring the partner in charge of employment because they have a very interesting proposal about home office and some kind of solutions for that to, to pitch. <clears throat> that would be a way to get them two links to the firm as long as you succeed. Yeah. So that's the cross-sell meeting. An interesting idea. I don't know if you're going to like this. I think this could be kind of embarrassing for some of the Europeans. It would be to do a thing called a circle of love. Coming back to that question about what do they do? What can they offer? One way to do this is to have your cross-sell meeting and each person pitches and they say, this is what we do and this is why it's cool. This is our value proposition. That's one way to do it. A different way to do it is each person, let's say you have the real estate guy, all of the other lawyers and all of the other colleagues, they tell them what they think was of high value and it was appreciated from their work. So maybe it's, it's maybe it's just going to be kind of on a personal level. It's about being very responsive, positive attitude, very patient and so on. But the interesting thing is <clears throat> that the real estate person themselves might not realize what is of value to the other lawyers and therefore to the client from their perspective. That's the problem of being a specialist. For, that for you as a real estate specialist, you can have your opinion of what is the commodity stuff, what is the premium stuff, what is exciting, what is not exciting, doesn't necessarily meet, mean that that's going to meet reality expectations. Something that you think is really exciting might be far too complicated for anybody else to understand. Something that you think is kind of dull and boring, it's not that exciting for you, might actually be highly appreciated and cross-sellable for your colleagues. So the circle of love is we take it in turns, this would be like a 10, 15, 20 minute activity, where it's, that's why it's called circle of love, where the other lawyers, they tell you what's good about your practice, what's good about your solutions, what do they like? It has to be very positive. And we take notes about this. This can be, if it's not very embarrassing and <laughs> squeamish, this can actually be very insightful uh, in terms of what is valued and appreciated from the other colleagues. So that's, that's an activity that you could do. Um, okay, we have another question here from another an anonymous attendee. Okay, how do you apply a bonus on additional work after a T for three? Origination comes from the organizer, or is it split between the lawyers participating in the T for three? Okay, that's a that's a good question. I would say the person that was proactive to create that meeting, to introduce the person, and to get to get that work done, they are the ones that get rewarded for it. It was their initiative. Then moving forward, if the new lawyer does work with that client, then that that those billable hours and that work goes to the new lawyer. Um, I would reward those who originate and generate the meetings and get the get these these things to happen because it, we want them to encourage them to do it. Uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't get complicated here in splitting it between the lawyers participating in the in the T for three. Um, but again, it's it's it, it's possible to modify the system, but that I wouldn't that's not how I would I would recommend it. OK. Um, and again, of course, not just <clears throat> cross selling for to increase the value of the services provided to the client and um, to, to get more money for the law firm. But we can also, we mustn't be forgetting about matchmaking, that you want to also introduce your client to other non-lawyers, not even people in your firm, to build social equity and to build goodwill with them. If you get your client gets the feeling that you're only selling to them all the time, they're gonna get annoyed with you. So you have to mix it up. One thing that you probably don't have, but you should have, would be a, not just a tracker table about pitching, but it would be, and you can automate this, it would be a tracker table for forward pitching. So I would recommend you have 
March, April, May, June, July, August, all the way to the end of the year. And you have a list of your A clients and then your B clients, maybe some of the C clients. And we work out on a monthly basis, how are we going to keep in contact with them? So in one month, you're going to try and do cross-selling. Uh, you're going to try and introduce some of your colleagues to the A or B clients. That's good. But you can't do it every single month because they'll get annoyed with you. So one month you do the cross-sell. The next month you're going to send an article. The next month you're going to do a matchmake. You're going to introduce them to somebody. So to a tax advisor, to an accountant, to an IT person, to a designer. You know, you have your network. This is especially and maybe more relevant for your A clients. So what I mean to say is... Um, Take a systematic approach to maintaining client relations. You can't just do this ad hoc because it's never going to happen. Uh, especially focus on the A clients and the second place, the B clients. Um, Cross-selling can be part of it. Proactive pitching, another one, sending them an IDA can be part of it. But also matchmaking just for goodwill and social equity can also be part of it. And remember, some of the matchmaking, introduce client one to client two, isn't just for goodwill. It's very pragmatically to get a deal. If they buy and they sell, then you get a piece of the work. Oops. And the, the last concept was, again, the idea of the feast. A very simple idea. Uh, could be when you have a closing or when you have an event, you invite three or four of your lawyers uh, from different practices, you invite three or four of the key decision makers in that client, and you just have a big dinner, a big celebration. But at that feast, the idea here is to do all of these different introductions with your various colleagues. Um, and we have a question. Um, oh, okay, so just someone had to leave. Okay. Um, this can be more complicated. I have a paper about it, but I noticed that it's already half past nine. So um, these are the different places where I'm going to be. Today I'm in Skopje, uh, tomorrow Warsaw, next one week I'm in Cyprus in Germany. So if you notice I'm going to be around, you can meet me. I'm happy to meet. Um, there are some different next steps based on today's session. There are four different papers. There is the 124 Motivational Slope paper I wrote. There's the 14 Value Propositions in ESG and Environmental, the Client Lifecycle paper, an ideal cross-sell meeting paper. In fact, actually, that's a book. <laughs> um, so all four of those, they can expand into half-day or full-day um, training consultancies, or they can just be the paper. If you're interested in those topics, write to me. And again, based on what we were talking about today, if we want some in-house training about social media selling, that's one of the new topics I wrote at the end of 2022, uh, advanced cross-selling, even going beyond these four lectures, uh, and how do you integrate it all together, that's another one. And a simple idea on practice and product UVP creation. Um, Next month, at the end of the month, I'm going to be in one Balkan country. And that's exactly what we're going to do for two days. We have different practices. We're going to spend about an hour defining the UVPs of each of the different practices. There's seven or eight of them. And we're going to spend about an hour defining the products. What are the value propositions that we can actually offer? And then create that into the different menus. I'm very excited about this because this, it's an international law firm. This international law firm will be three steps ahead of any of the other Balkan law firms, because the other Balkan law firms don't have this. Even the Austrians usually don't have this. So you look at your wolf ties and your shown hair and, and, and so on. Uh, they have it some, well, actually, no, they usually don't actually have this at all, or not to that level. So that's an interesting activity that we can that we can do if you're interested. If you want a copy of the slides, I can send it to you. And of course, subscribe on the YouTube channel. Um, we have the daily Nikidonia shorts, two to three minute videos about different key concepts. You can see them on my LinkedIn. And on my LinkedIn and on the YouTube, you can see the, um, the live stream next week uh, about persuasive email. Depending on how this, the live streams go, I think that we're gonna be moving away from Zoom just onto live stream on YouTube. It'll be much easier. You just go on YouTube and you watch it because these Zooms, they can be a bit of a nuisance. So. Um, I talked a lot today, but we did have some questions. Uh, if you have any thoughts or ideas, or if I manage to catch your attention with any of these CTAs, these call to action, drop me a message. Um, I'm always very happy to hear from you. And hopefully I'll see you next week on Wednesday for persuasive writing, and then on Thursday for cross-selling part four. Okay, thank you very much.